everybody. I am Alberio here hosting for Mark today with Ken Verderami, a UFO researcher. Hello, Ken. How are you? Good. How are you? I feel a little flighty today. I see. Uh, we, we, we like seeing you here. In fact, I brought with me for this special show uh, for Marty Winkle, the producer here, to show our one of my fleet of UFOs going over Bays Mountain Park in Tennessee one day up there. Very nice. That's very, yeah, very nice. So we've got a nice little show for you today with Ken. Unidentified flying objects versus the unidentified aerial phenomenon, which is a new word that's being coined, Ken. Yeah, the government likes to change things every once in a while to keep people guessing, I guess. So we'll talk about that. We will talk about that. We love them guessing about my species and what we're all doing here. <laughs> As many of my friends in East Tennessee have are familiar with seeing UFOs up there, uh, like these invading Bays Mountain Park in Kingsport, Tennessee. And we also chased Hale Bop over the observatory one night up there with one of our red of many types of vehicles that we use up there to keep the friendly skies and keep you humans on your toes, Ken. We are certainly guessing, that's for sure. Well, and you're guessing that this is not Alberio. This is Mark here. So we're glad to have you all here and join our little fun and games today as we talk about unidentified flying objects and versus unidentified aerial phenomenon with my good friend Ken uh, Verderami. I misspelled his name there. It is Verderami <laughs> on there, but I told him I might not be the first one to uh, misspell that. But uh, uh, Ken, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, and then we'll we'll sit back and listen to what you're going to get the cutting edge of UFOs because you are sort of a researcher in this. All right, so um, I'm not going to read that whole slide deal. You guys can just uh, look at that as I go here, but I'll just hit the highlights. So uh, top line there, 37 years total with the Department of Defense, all sorts of uh, both uh, space and uh, air programs. Uh, I worked uh, as a NASA space shuttle uh, flight control and propulsion instructor for a while, uh, helping train the astronauts how to fly that vehicle. Uh, and then probably the most interesting part of that whole uh, synopsis is in the middle there where it says, uh, I've uh, been to and worked at uh, Area 51. So that's probably what we're going to focus most about today. But I will tell you that um, it's probably not necessarily exactly what you think, but we'll talk about at least some of the things that I can uh, talk about what's going on there as we go through this. Now, how about that? The gentleman has been in Area 51. Also, I tease him. He is an astronaut washout. You've tried a couple <laughs> times, four or five times, correct? Yeah, if I was a, uh, what they call a, uh, a finalist uh, five times without unfortunately getting in. So and but, without getting into it too much, uh, there is a little bit about who you know, not what you know, to be final selection of an astronaut, right, Ken? <laughs> it does help. That is for sure. Help, but, uh, well, anyway, good. I'm going to let, uh, uh, here is the button there for the next button there. All right. Uh, for your uh, your program here. And let's turn over this. Ken, before I do turn you loose, tell people what I'll, uh, what you do on cruise ships, too. So, um, so I, I retired uh, full-time from... Uh, doing space stuff uh, for the government last year. This July will be actually one year for me. And uh, since 2018, I've kind of had a little side job as uh, what's known in the industry as a uh, cruise ship enrichment lecturer. And if you've ever been on a cruise ship, you know probably that uh, you've seen or gone to people who lecture during cruise ships. Well, I'm one of those guys. And uh, my specialty, as should be no surprise, is astronomy and space exploration. So that's what I lecture about. Uh, in it. And I've been with every major cruise line in the world, been all over the world doing this. Uh, I spend a lot of time with Viking cruises. I'm, in addition to an enrichment lecture with them, I'm what is called a uh, resident astronomer, which is a different position on board two of their ships, where in addition to doing lectures for them, I also do star parties at night. We turn off the lights uh, on board and ship and take everybody outside, as you can imagine, being 2,000 miles in the open ocean, what the night sky looks like. Uh, we do question and answer sessions where people can come and talk to me or ask me pretty much anything they want about uh, astrophysics. Those are entertaining sessions because people usually want to talk about aliens. So we usually spend most of that hour talking about that topic. Uh, and then um, we uh, actually those two ships have actual planetariums on board. And I give a live uh, planetarium show that's uh, 
tuned to the actual latitude that the ship is at. And those are about 15 minute presentations that I narrate as well. So that's what I spend my time doing uh, these days now that I'm uh, kind of retired from the government. And he's an excellent astrophotographer and a good uh, contributor here to the Space Coast Astronomy Clubs and so forth. And uh, glad to have you on there. Well, now, great. The, the pics uh, brings the pictures up there. And then next is the thing in line. So, All right, so enjoy. Let's see. What, right, let's go back here. Whoops. Um, Hit the, uh, the pics. Oh. Oh, Marty's got it. Okay. Okay. There you go. Um, all right. So enough of that. So next here. Okay. So this is uh, in part some of the lecture I uh, I give when I uh, uh, go on cruise ships. And so uh, I start with this picture here. And if you happen to be involved in UFO research at all, this is kind of a famous image for ufologists because what's depicted here is what some believe to be an actual uh, secret alien base on the moon. Now, a lot of people laugh at that when you hear that uh, initially, but I'll point out some things that maybe give you an idea of why people tend to think that way. So in the natural world, we don't see right angles. That's a human kind of thing, okay? So whenever we look at an image, of something in the natural world, in this case, the surface of the moon, and we see things that appear to be right angles, people tend to think that that is possibly human made. And if you look there, particularly uh, if you look at about the four o'clock position uh, off of the inside of the crater rim, right down a little lower, it goes straight down right there. Uh, you can see something looks like a square, and that starts to tend to get people excited that that might be man-made. Same kind of thing if you go to the 11 o'clock position and look at the crater rim, you'll see where it's really dark. Keep going all the way up, all the way up to the edge right there. That area has got a bunch of straight lines that easily could be interpreted as structures and buildings. And then off to the right, where the arrow is actually covering up, you'll see a white area. And again, lots of linear features there that some people think are man-made or alien-made structures. Okay. I'm going to leave that for you to interpret on your own here while we move uh, on with the actual presentation. All right, I'll let you read this. This is probably my favorite cartoon that I've ever seen in a magazine or a uh, newspaper. And it's because it kind of is a cautionary tale for us humans on uh, more than one level, for sure. <laughs> so... Uh, Gallup poll, everybody's familiar with our friends of Gallup. They like to do uh, surveys about the interesting uh, topics. And they did a, a poll recently about uh, the UFO phenomena. And one of the things they found that I thought was rather interesting was that 33% uh, of all those people who were actually, uh, who took the poll, believed that UFOs are actually alien spacecraft visiting from other planets or uh, other galaxies. And then below that, the other interesting statistic, twice that many people believe that our government uh, is actually hiding and knows more about UFOs than they are telling us. Mm -hmm. And so I'll start this off by telling you that's absolutely true. The government is, in fact, I'm not going to use the term hiding. I'll use a different word, but the government absolutely knows way more about this than they're telling the public. That this is, is from a man who, I'm not going to probe you, but you've been to Area 54. <laughs> Yeah. So yes. yeah, 51, I mean, so 54 that, was the club. That, <laughs> I've, been to, I've been to 54. I've not been there. Club 54. That's right. You've been to Area 51. Yeah. So, I just want to reinforce that. So uh, it is absolutely true. Wow. Uh, the really? government knows a lot more than they're telling people. And we're going to get into a little bit of the why about that. A lot of people go immediately to conspiracy theories and lots of negative things. But I think there are some what I'll call reasonably valid reasons for some of the secrecy, not necessarily all of it, but some of it. And hopefully uh, you'll you'll see that picture emerge as, as we go here. Okay, so I want to take a little history tour before we get into what's going on more recently. And I'd like to start with the relatively famous uh, Roswell incident, right? So in 1947, something happened out in the New Mexico desert, right? Flying saucer, weather balloon, who knows, right? Lots of speculation. Uh, and in fact, what happened, uh, actually nothing happened for many, many years. It wasn't until uh, the rather famous uh, UFO researcher Stanley Freeman 
saw this information in the 80s and started to look into that. So the information sat around for 30 some odd years. It was no big deal. It was one of those footnotes in history. So he started researching this and he went and tried to find some of the original people from the incident in Roswell. And sure enough, uh, he found a couple of those, including the uh, public information officer for Roswell Army Airfield at that time, who actually still lived uh, in Roswell. And so he went to him and uh, had a chat with him. And the interesting, several interesting things come out of this particular incident is that uh, what first happened was is very quickly after the incident happened at the, uh, the ranch, there was a story put out by the local um, Air Force Base that we had that they had recovered a flying saucer. OK, well, uh, and you can see and you remember or maybe not remember what the very famous uh, newspaper headlines that I showed in the previous slide of that uh, depiction that we found a flying saucer. Well, the very next day, what happens? The Army Air, the Army Air Force puts out a second uh, public release mm -hmm. statement that says, no, 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 it wasn't an alien spacecraft, it wasn't a flying saucer, it was just a weather balloon, and they produced uh, the, Army, the intelligence officer and a few others, and those rather famous pictures of them kneeling along the scattered, what appears to be images of a weather balloon saying that that's all this was, it can't be anything else. Okay, and so that, right, for UFO researchers, that really started what is rather known as the most famous cover-up in UFO history. So uh, the thing about the Roswell incident is that it's pretty hard you know, there's been a lot of study on that individual incident, and it's pretty obvious that whatever was recovered, not a weather balloon, right? Pretty easy to distinguish weather balloon from pieces of a uh, a flying craft. The pieces they found are clearly uh, not that, so it can't be that. People have studied the weather patterns. They've gone back and pulled information on uh what the Air Force was doing at the time, there was no research or weather balloons being uh, launched or up in the air at all in anywhere near that area. And so the fact that the Air Force reported it was a weather balloon that crashed simply makes no sense. It's an interesting cover story, but and it, it helped people at the time, but now people are way more sophisticated in the research. And clearly that's not uh, what happened. Whatever happened there, the weather balloon's not the answer. Okay. I'm going to leave that one alone. I'll come back at the end and tell you what probably happened there uh, from what I understand. I don't know for sure, but I have a really good source of information on, on what occurred there. And the, what happened there probably is going to surprise you. What I will tell you is that incident is real. Something actually crashed in the desert there. And we'll leave it at that for the minute. All right. Stay curious. All right, so you can do, any any U.S. citizen can do this. It's called uh, Freedom of Information Act request. You can go to our government and you can file a FOIA request and request that the government release information it has to you as a U.S. citizen, as long as that information is not currently classified by the government. UFO researchers have been doing this for a long time. And I just pulled a couple of uh, the more interesting ones that were received based on some FOIA requests that were done in the past. So the first one in the upper right hand corner is a declassified photo from the CIA of what appears to be a flying disc and a uh, gentleman in a nice CIA style trench coat standing next to it. <laughs> so the question you have to ask. Scully and. Uh, yeah, Mueller. It could, could, could be Scully Mueller there. Yeah, yeah. So the question you have to ask of this, if this is fake, which some people claim it is, why is it classified, right? There's no reason to classify things that are fake that makes no sense, okay? And so if it's real, well, it could be real and be a real physical object. It could be real and be a man-made object, right? We know uh, the Germans were working on flying wings and flying discs storing World War II. Uh, this could be easily a captured one of those. Or it could be 
uh, something not of this earth that we have managed to get our hands on. Okay, uh, down lower left-hand corner is a declassified CIA memo, again, obtained by a FOIA request. I'll let you look at that. Unfortunately, a lot of it is redacted. Now, the reason you will see redacted information, which is just basically blacked out information, even in something that is released to the public, the reason we do that is not necessarily because we don't, we, the government, don't want to release a particular piece of information. The reason is, is they're trying to protect what is known as sources and methods, okay? That's the most important part of the intelligence uh, apparatus that we have in our country. We need to protect how we collect information and where we collect information so that our adversaries don't know how we do that. And so when we release information like this, even though we may release the results of that information, which is the un, uh, which is the stuff that's not blacked out, how we got that information, we if that method is still classified, we want to protect that, and so that's blacked out. And so that's mm -hmm. what's lightly blacked out in that memo there, which is not really the important piece of information. The important piece of information, if you're a UFO researcher, is what did they what are they reporting on and if you read that memo it's reporting on a, a particular incident where there was some reasonably substantial evidence that uh, witnesses who were relatively credible had seen uh ufo phenomena of the time so there's tons of this kind of information out for and again it's not fake you know the government's not in the habit of making fake documents and classifying them there's no purpose to that because if it's classified you can't look at it Right. So that doesn't make a lot of sense when people tell you that that's disinformation. All right. Let's jump to the let's jump to more current things here. If you've been reasonably paying attention uh, to popular media in the last year or two, you're probably familiar with the terms Tic Tacs, Gimbals and Go Fast. Those have been uh, popularized by the, uh, the popular media for three of the more famous videos that were released by uh, the media or by the military over the last couple of years. 2017 is when the New York Times uh, put out that story about uh, the incident on the Nimitz in 2004 with Commander Fravor, which we'll talk about here uh, in a second. But that got this whole thing uh, rolling about uh, what's the military and what does our government really know about UFOs and what's been going on uh, since, say, Project Blue Book back in the 50s. And what's been going on, of course, is in 2007, uh, the DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, created something called ATIP in 2007 to investigate UFOs. Right? We know that uh, as a fact right now. In fact, um, Lou Elizondo, a name you may be familiar with, uh, was the head of ATIP for a while. And he's been uh, relatively vocal the last year or two about the fact that the government uh, should come out and uh, do more in the world of researching these and let the public know more about what's going on than we are currently doing. Okay, well, that program was only around for five years. It ended in 2012. And Lou Alessandra actually left that agency before it closed in 2012. And the principal reason he said he left is that he was trying to get most of what ATIP had collected up to the senior levels of the Defense Department, all the way up to the Secretary of Defense. He says that he was being stopped at the lower levels and he could never get to the Secretary of Defense. In fact, he couldn't even get to uh, the heads of the military departments to show them what ATIP had discovered. And he got so frustrated with that process that he decided he was going to quit. And the reason uh, he left to go on the outside is he felt he had a better chance of getting the government to bring this information out into the public if you work from the outside than working from the inside. Now, remember, like all of us that are ever involved in a black program or classified programs, you sign lots of things called NDAs, which are non-disclosure agreements that say you will not divulge this classified information that you're working on. Well, as you can imagine, Lou signed plenty of those as well. And he stated many times he's not going to violate any of those NDAs that are currently in effect, because they're basically in effect forever, 
Uh, and so he's working around the fringes of that where he can to try to talk about and get this information. He's been reasonably effective at getting uh, interest uh, from the public at large and from Congress and, and the government particularly uh, to, uh, uh, to take notice and to maybe pay a little bit more attention to this. So, so Lou's been doing that. Well, uh, as most people probably realize, we've, the government now stood up a new organization. And uh, if you look at the slide here, yeah, let me go back here. And uh, in, uh, so this new organization is called the Unidentified Aerial Phenomena Task Force, right? Uh, UAP Task Force. And that was created back on August 4th of 2020. So relatively recently, okay? And UTAP has a very simple mission, okay? They're basically to try to analyze and catalog UAPs that could potentially pose a threat to national security. <clears throat> Very simple. Now, so the people, you know, people ask, well, why is the government all of a sudden doing this? Well, I would pose a goal that they're not all of a sudden, they've been doing this for a very long time. And the reason that they've been doing it is that last piece of that statement there, the national security threat. These objects, pose what we constitute or what we believe to be a threat to national security because of the way they interact in our airspace. And I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. But that's the purpose for why the government set this agency up. They didn't set it up to go prove that aliens exist. That may or may not be a side benefit, of it, but that's not the purpose of the organization. The organization is stood up as a national security uh, threat identification organization. And that's why there's tax money being put to it. Okay, if you look at these two pictures here, uh, this picture, if you look at the left one, was taken from the back seater of an F-18. And circled in red is some object. And, and he took this picture with a cell phone. So no high, no sophisticated camera, just an uh, air crew dude sitting in the back of a jet on a sortie, and he took this picture. If you look at the right-hand picture and you blow up that uh, image a little bit, uh, it becomes a lot more interesting. So I don't know what that thing is, but I can tell you I've never seen any aerospace vehicle uh, that mm. looks like that, right? And and I've flown in 56 different military and civilian airplanes, and we don't have anything that looks like that. So. Mm. Like a Chevron in the sky. Yeah, it's bizarre. Okay. This picture is a still frame from a video for what's called the gimbal video. Now, this is an object being tracked by an F-18. And if you notice, uh, well, you can't see it because it's, it's a still picture, but the reason it's called a gimbal video, because as they're, they've got a, a uh, radar lock on this image, as you can tell by the two bars, so the, the uh, F-18's radar is tracking it. And what happens is, is this vehicle, while it's flying through the atmosphere, starts to rotate 360 degrees. Well, I'm here to tell you, if you don't know, we don't have anything that knows how to do that. Right. Okay, so it got very quickly named uh, the gimbal uh, video. <clears throat> and again, verified video uh, from the Department of the Navy, not fake, actual video from an F-18. And the F-18 had multiple sensors on this vehicle, not just uh, visible uh, uh, photographic image like you see here, but it used its FLIR, that IR, so lots of different uh, metrics besides just the visual image that was captured. Now, one of the things I want you to take a, a really quick or a detailed notice of is if you look in the image, you see this kind of white aura surrounding that black vehicle. So yeah. th this image is taken by the FLIR, this particular one. And so it's showing temperature variations and it's uh the darker the thing is the cooler it is relative to the surrounding image so the vehicle itself is black so it's the coolest part of that image and then you can see around it it appears to be warmer in some sense mm -hmm. now that kind of i'll just call it a haze is not a uh a remnant of the instrumentation that actually appears to be there and so there's something surrounding that vehicle that the FLIR has captured. 
Like an exhaust from a jet, quite well, possibly, or something to do with that. Yeah, or maybe system. even more a, a, a distortion of uh, space around it, because there is no... Cloaking. Like yeah, cloaking, um, right? or, or, well, uh, some postulate it, it could be, right? These vehicles demonstrate no visible means of propulsion, including this one. Uh, so some have speculated this, you could be see remnants of uh, the gravity field being distorted around it, which is how it does a propulsion huh. not out of the realm of possibilities particularly as we understand uh, einstein physics well the key is that the government says these are definitely not photoshopped absolutely right, with that in there we've got marty we've got a lot of people interested in our program here with ken verderami uh who is a, a a friend here on the space coast the astronomy clubs he's a retired air force colonel and uh, spent some time uh, in some black ops operations, including at the uh, Area 51. Marty, who we got a question from? Yeah, Marty's got a question. <laughs> All right. Okay. You said that object rotated through that six degrees. So to me, in my mind, rotated is just rolling. We do have aircraft that can roll 360. So what, what is rotating? Like a top? Like a line of top chip? Yeah, so, so when an airplane rolls, Right. And so th this thing, the, the, the reason that I say you're right, we have obviously aircraft that can that 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 can roll like that. But we it use the vehicles use aerodynamic surfaces to make that happen. Right. Your ailerons are OK. This vehicle has none of those yet. It's still able to roll and fly in a, in a straight direction. So how does it do that? But if it had the equivalent of RCS jets, you won't but we don't see that. We, we see no visible means of propulsion, yet it's able to maneuver, including rolling while traveling in a straight line. And so that, that's the struggle we have, is that if, if, if there was even, room, even minimal propulsion system that was obvious to us, then sure, it should be able to flex the atmosphere like we do, but it demonstrates no propulsion means at all. It's just a thing in space, yet it can maneuver in space somehow. We have no idea. We, we do not know how to do put something in an object in the atmosphere and have it maneuver. Yet we don't have any aerodynamic surfaces. We have no propulsion systems. Yet it's able to do things that we even our aircraft can't do. That's the struggle here. Good, Marty. You'd see uh, if there was RCS type thrusters, you'd see the heat. You would see something, something, particularly with yeah. the FLIR image. You, you would have uh -huh. seen something. Yeah. Okay. So what do we actually know about UAPs? So these are the five things that should get people really excited in one form or another when you think about a UAP. Number one, as we just talked about, they have no visible means of propulsion, yet they're maneuvering through our atmosphere without issue. They have no dynamic surfaces, which we believe is the only way to execute a flight inside of our atmosphere, right? There's if you're going to execute controlled aerodynamic flight, you need some kind of aerodynamic surface. If you're out in space with no atmosphere, you can use reaction systems like we do with all our rockets and shuttles with thrust. We see none of that on these vehicles. They demonstrate acceleration rates that literally exceed hundreds of Gs. Hundreds. Mm, okay? Wow. Would kill a person. It would, uh, it, it, it would, it would crush of G's, you. Right? Dozens of Gs would kill a yeah, person. Yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, for example, right on on an F sixteen, <coughs> excuse me, or on an F fifteen, we have a G limiter on the airplane. We limit the Gs to seven point three three Gs. Wow. It's not an airplane limit. That's a human limit. Seven point three. In 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 an F sixteen, we routinely do pull nine Gs. And although I've never been in an F twenty two or an F thirty five, same thing for those. But again. I'm here to tell you, you don't do it for very long, and it's extraordinarily painful. And Even then they, they're equipped with and, things and, on their legs. And we have so all important. sorts of things to help us sustain even 30 seconds at 9 Gs. These things do hundreds of Gs. Hundreds. Now, it's possible, particularly given the size of some of them, that they may be simply drones with no biological entity in them. Okay, that that's fine, but they still execute two 300 G maneuvers. Hmm. Okay, number four, they demonstrate speeds far in excess of any current technology that we have for aerodynamic flight. These things are hypersonic, Mach 5 to Mach 20. Okay, we don't have vehicles that can fly 
at those speeds. Okay, we more right more. Three of them are in museums, the shuttles. Yep. Now, and then the fifth one, which is something that a lot of people don't necessarily realize, but is really important, is that they're trans medium capable, which means they we've witnessed them fly through the atmosphere, descend to the ocean, submerge in the ocean, and go through the ocean, and then reappear in the atmosphere and take off again. Okay, we have no vehicle that I know about that is trans medium capable. That is a capability that humans do not have right now. Okay, these vehicles all have those five capabilities. Marty's got a question there from one of our. He's asking if no Simon Goons. Yes, and I was going to get to that. And then the, the other Mark, one. Mark Usiak asked about sonic booms in our app. And, and that's a very good question. These things do not produce any sonic booms, even though they travel at hypersonic speeds. And if someone out there would like to explain to me the physics of that, I'm all ears. Okay? Right, right, right. And sonic booms caused by something going through and, and the atmosphere is basically I mean, it's, it's, compressed in front of it. It's it's a basic yeah, outcome thing, of yeah. physics of flight in the atmosphere. That's the way things work as we understand physics. Yet none of these vehicles have ever been observed producing a sonic boom, wow. even though they travel many times faster than the speed of sound. Hmm. Okay, These little things that a lot of the debunkers arm wave away you need to poke at these people because you can't arm wave away these things. These are real physics based things that have been observed and recorded by various sensors and we know they're real. All right, let's keep going. So that brings us to the next question, which is, OK, where do they come from? And then, of course, the, the correlate that is why all the secrecy around this whole thing. Well, in my mind, we've only got three realistic possibilities for where do these things have come from. Number one. They're classified U.S. military technology. Absolute possibility. Okay. Number two, there's some advanced military technology from the Russians or the Chinese. It's also a possibility as well. And number three, they're alien. They're not from Earth. They're from some other place. Okay. There's some ancillary what is, but those are the three basic categories. They really can't that these yeah, things have to fall into. Absolutely, it sounds logical. Okay. Sounds very logical. Now. <laughs> The, the why all the secrecy part is something I alluded to before, and that's this national security aspect. Okay? These things are seen routinely uh, incurring into U.S. space, unannounced, sometimes unknown until they're very far into U.S. borders. They fly around with impunity. They demonstrate physical capabilities that we do not possess and then they disappear. I can tell you that's the very definition of a threat to national security, and that's why the government is so interested in this. It really doesn't have a lot to do with, let's go find aliens. Now, we may get to that point, but it really is a national security issue for the government, and that's what they're trying to focus on. And of course, anytime you get into national security, you get into secrecy. They go hand in hand, and so there's gonna be a lot of this that we want to remain classified. And I personally don't have a lot of problem with that part of it, but there's a lot of this that I think doesn't have anything to do with national security. And I think the public can and actually has a right to know that. And unlike a lot of the doomsday people, I don't think the entire fabric of society will collapse mm -hmm. if we start releasing some of this information. Can that, you, uh, you said that these are seen routinely by our great military men and women aviators. Is that like, uh, there are weekly basis, monthly, any, I, I, I mean, at, at least month. There are there are hundreds and hundreds of reports so over we, the years. So our great men and women in the, in the Air Force and other flying thing, most of them have probably seen something. I, I, I don't know about most, but a lot have seen a them. lot, even though they don't talk about it. They're, they're, and now that we've got uh, one of the things that uh, the class, the, the new task force has done is they've set up a very robust mechanism for military personnel to report mm -hmm. any time that they have an incident and document it and, and get the stigma of not talking about it out so they can actually collect real data and go try to figure out what's going on because they really don't have a good handle on what's mm -hmm. going on. And the first part of that is you need actual data. So that's 
that's a good part of what this class, this task force is doing is giving it's destigmatizing it for the military and it's giving the, the actual military uh, service personnel an avenue to report it and you know encouraging reporting of this so that it can send out someone or someone wants to go and collect the data do interviews and try to see if they can you know get some more information so that's a big deal because it's a huge in the step. 50s, 60s, 70s. You were, you would if you saw something you didn't want to tell you were, anybody because you were you're a tin hat guy. Yeah, that's, that's you right. think you're nuts yep. and get a be flying a desk one day, right? Absolutely. So, yep. Awesome. Good question there. Ken Verderami here talking about uh, what he knows or he can tell us anyway <laughs> about the UAP's unidentified aerial phenomenon. Yes, Marty. Mark Usiak is asking: Has any air samples been taken in the wake? Of any of these vehicles air samples taken in the wake of these vehicles that's a very interesting question mark you I, I i i don't know personally that they have i would think that that would be somewhat difficult to do just because of the speeds involved and the fact that it's a you know it's not like we know they're going to be at spot a so we can kind of go go set up yeah. and go collect data on them they just appear and then we collect whatever we can at the time and, and, and air samples. Well, that would be interesting. I would venture to say that would be very, I highly doubt we have any, and I, I'm not sure how we would go about. They don't stick doing, around very long either. With, and, and how do you, and, things and, going on, but good question. Good thinking. Now. Well, and, and, and I can tell you that the, the few times where there have been encounters with aircraft, like with Commander Fravor, anytime our aircraft made uh, any, uh, maneuver towards them, they just maneuvered away. They had no interest in letting us get very close to them for whatever reason. So we're probably going to find that extraordinarily difficult to do. So Russian or Chinese? All right. So let's look at the three possibilities and why I'm, I don't, why I think what I think. So is it advanced Russian Chinese technology? I'm going to tell you it's not. And the reason I'm going to tell you it's not is a couple of things. Number one is our intelligence services are as some of you probably know and, and most of you maybe realize is significantly more robust than a lot of people realize and quite frankly we would have detected some inkling of this technology a long time ago if either of them had been working on this the other spy thing versus spy yeah, yeah. Uh, and the other thing is is remember these crafts have been sighted for over 70 years in one form or another and I can tell you from being in the business for 37 years, there's absolutely no way that our friends in Russia and China, if they had this kind of advanced capability, that they would not have used it long a long time ago. And the reason for that is this type of technology is so far advanced from what we have in the U.S. that militarily, it's a complete game changer. We have no defense against the kind of capabilities we see these craft exhibit. Mm -hmm. So if you're a if you're a hostile nation and you have military capabilities like that, why would you been what are you waiting for? Mm -hmm. Right? The Chinese and the Russians have stated publicly for as long as they've been around that they have no interest in the West being around as a civilization. We know that, right? Yikes, yikes. Right? And yeah, so we do know that. Right? Th th their interest lies in other directions. And if they had a capability that was so far advanced from ours that they could further those aims, why would they not do it? It makes no sense. So I'm going to tell you, and our and and our intelligence services believe that it's not Russian, it's not Chinese. Okay, so that that that, that eliminates those guys. So no, next one, how about classified U.S. military technology? I'm going to tell you that's no as well. Two reasons for that. Number one, the, the military is actually testified in front of Congress that says that. These craft are not ours. Now, of course, they could be um, fibbing to Congress, right? I mean, I mean no way. So, <laughs> I mean, I, it's it wouldn't be the first I time. I see Ali North up there. And, yeah. You know, so sitting up there 20, 50, 40 years ago. Right. But um, again, ha having worked in this area for 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 many many years, I have a reasonable idea of the kinds of technology the government spends taxpayers on or spends taxpayer money on and again if we had this kind of technology uh we'd be using it classified or not right we had the 117 around we didn't hesitate to use it when we thought it was in our national interest in a war and we sent them and we used them and it became unclassified very quickly didn't matter that was the purpose of that right so again 
not very likely. And then here's the other one why I absolutely know, I'm going to state categorically, it's not U.S. tech. In the world of classified operations, you sign, as I mentioned, you sign these things called non-disclosure agreements. Anybody who works in a program signs one, and you're not to talk, obviously, to anybody outside who's not already briefed in the program. Well, every once in a while, it happens that a person who's not briefed to the program gets exposed to that classified material. It could be inadvertent or, or not. And the way this happens a lot is uh, you go to a, uh, when we used to do conferences, we used to do big technology conferences, you'd have hundreds of people go to them and we'd be talking, somebody would be briefing about a program and you'd get some smart guy in the audience or smart gal who knows a lot about this and some things don't seem to make sense in the presentation. The reason they don't make sense is because the person is omitting classified pieces of it that they're obviously not going to talk about. Well, the smart person can read between the lines. They start asking questions and very quickly, unbeknownst to themselves, they deduce pieces of classified information and they talk about them in public. Now, nobody knows they're classified. Of course, the briefer does because the briefer is this program. He probably just realized that there's classified information that's just been out in the open. So what happens during that situation is that Nobody says anything because the last thing you want to do is say, oh, sir, please don't talk about that class of information because you've right. now exposed it, right? So we, we don't talk about it. You let it go on. At the end of the conference, very quietly, someone will contact that individual who's briefed the program, the security person. They'll bring them into uh, a classified forum. They'll explain to them what happened. They'll present them with a non-disclosure agreement, national security agreement for them to sign saying that you have inadvertently been exposed to classified information, sign this NDA, therefore you are bound never to speak of it again because you now are aware of it. And they sign that, and that's how we make that go away. Okay, so let's roll back to Commander Fravor 2004. If, like some people claim, what he witnessed was a test of classified U.S. military technology, which I'll tell you why that can't be true in a second here, but let's say he was one. If he actually witnessed a classified object being tested, once he landed, he and his crew members, they would have been debriefed and they would have all signed NDA saying you can never speak about what you witnessed or what you saw anyway, because you, you got exposed to classified information. Commander Fravor has said many times he's never been defensively debriefed about that incident. Tell us that incident, refresh that inf incident. First. So 2004 on the Nimitz. He was flying aircraft carrier. aircraft carrier Nimitz off of San Diego doing the standard workup maneuvers for deployment. Uh, he and his uh, wingman, uh, they got vectored from uh, the Nimitz to an object uh, to try to go down and, and chase it. And this object had been seen by the carrier group the week or two before. Actually, many of these objects off and on over the days. And so then another one appeared. They were sent out to try to, to track it down and to chase it. They ended up uh, finding it, uh, capturing on radar, locking it up. Uh, they've got IR data. They've got visual photographic data. And it's a little white object that Commander Fravor named the Tic Tac because it looked like a Tic Tac. It's about 30 foot long in the shape of a Tic Tac. And it displayed all those five things that I mentioned uh, that uh, we can't duplicate. But it, it demonstrated all of them during the course of their maybe 10 or 15 minute encounter. And one of the most interesting things about that encounter that a lot of people don't realize is that at the very end, when it disappeared, like it, it, they locked it up for a little while and then it just accelerated and they couldn't keep up with it and it just disappeared. Less than five, uh, like three and a half seconds later, that same object appeared 60 miles further away from his aircraft and the point he appeared at is what was called his cap, which is his combat air patrol, which is the point in space he's going to go to next during his maneuvers. Mm. And the only, the only place that that information was stored is inside the flight computer of his F-18 and in his brain. Yet somehow the Tic Tac knew where that cap was and went to that exact spot in space that wow. he was supposed to go to later on. Huh. Okay. I want you all to think about that as well. So 
did it you know did it bore into his brain probably not <laughs> but what it telepathy what, right but what it probably did is it accessed his flight computer and pulled the data off it. That's a real possibility. I've never heard of anything like that. Yeah, that's that's if if you watch the detail of that report that and you listen to his interviews, uh, that is part of that incident as well. Okay. And, and the Tic Tac would do that to just mess with him and say, Well, who knows? Who, who knows? Who knows? Who knows why? But it it went to his cap and then it stood there for a short period of time and then and then disappeared. Wow. We got a couple more questions sure. here with Ken Verderami. We know it's always a popular program about UFOs and these unidentified aerial phenomenon. I'm fascinated by it. I hope you're staying curious, Marty. Yeah, Mark Busiak again. What is the closest distance we have been able to get to to one of these uh, UAPs? Closest distance to one of these UAPs. Oh. An F-18 is maybe. I, 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 I'm going to say the the for the ones that I'm. Commander Fravers is, is probably the, the closest one um, within, uh, he was within, boy, I have to try to remember. I would say something I don't, it may not be true. You can go look it up in the record, but it it's pretty close. It's not very far away. You're talking five miles? Or yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, no more than that, it's, and it's probably under that. They, uh -huh. they got pretty close to it, miles. and as they tried to get closer, that's when it would basically just maintain the separation anytime, it, you know. Uh, while while they were flight following along the same path, everything was fine. Mm -hmm. As he turned into it, it would turn away and main and and not let it get any closer. They still call them bogies. Uh, sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep. And they're doing the movies. So. Right. Yeah. <laughs> World War Two turn too. Marty, okay. another question. Yeah, Robert Law is asking: Was the U.S. not using Aurora in the eighties and nineties? UFO UFO crash off coast. Dang. UFO crash off. Must, must be off, off coast of Scotland in the 90s. Could have been a U.S. spaceship. Uh, Robert Law's in Dundee, Scotland, one of our A-listing friends up there. He was just at a UFO conference up there in Scotland. He's asking about a UFO that crashed off the Scotland coast in the 90s. In the 90s. Yeah, I don't know a lot about that incident in particular, but um, I will tell you this. I, I doubt it was a U.S. craft that crashed. Okay. Um, uh, if you could get some more information, I might that might jog my memory, but I'm not 100% sure of the specific yeah. incident. Yeah, message me about that, Robert. Yeah, we'll we get go, it to Ken and we can detail. follow up on that. We hope you're enjoying this fascinating program on Stay Curious. All right. Continue, sir. So, all right. So, again, not U.S. technology because one of the most well-known incidents documented by the air crew, that air crew was not debriefed after the incident, which mm. absolutely would have happened sure. if they witnessed classified technology. Now, here's the other thing I know. Okay, I've been in the flight test business for 20 some odd years, right? Went to test pilot school, all that great stuff. I can tell you for a fact, that's not the way we test technology. We do not take classified or unclassified technology and go to a military exercise area where there's ongoing military air crew training and say, hey, let's see what our stuff does. That is the dumbest thing in the world you could ever do. Yeah. We go in a controlled environment. Mm -hmm. That's what Edwards Air Force Base is for. That's what Pax River is for. That's what Eglin Air Force Base is for. It's controlled flight test airspace. No one's allowed in there but us doing flight tests. We spend weeks, sometimes months, prepping for a single two or three hour flight mm -hmm. sortie. And, and we clear the so, airspace, everything else. So not so, the ocean off San Diego. Uh, wandering Nimitz, around where yeah. there's a Nimitz carry group of yeah. 20 ships, F-18s flying everywhere, and we're going to insert our classified technology and, quote, see what happens? Doesn't happen. That is not the way we do things. So, again, not military technology from the U.S. that they saw. All right. So, Ken, we're getting down here to what right. nitty gritty. What so, is it? So, guess what? That only, in my mind, that leaves one possibility. I'm going to tell you straight up, that's alien. I call it what you want, but I don't think, given what we have witnessed, classified and unclassified, uh, that it can be a, a something from a civilization here on this planet that has created. Just to me, it doesn't make any sense. Okay, so we've said this many times, and the first thing you hear from any mainstream scientist. Yeah, yeah. And I've heard this forever, and I and I, you know, I'm one of those guys, right? I'm, uh -huh. right? I've got a couple of of uh, scientific degrees as well as engineering degrees, and and so I'm one of these scientists, and I laugh at those guys because here's what they tell you: they'll tell you that said, well, you know, it takes seventy thousand years to reach 
the nearest star, right, Proxima Centauri, to Earth. Mm -hmm. And because it takes 70,000 years to get to the nearest star, there's no way they could be aliens because it takes 70,000 years. That makes no sense. Well, the problem with that, my friends, is that that supposes that they're using current Earth-based propulsion systems. That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It's utterly ridiculous. It's like in 1900, who would have thought what this was? Right. A cell phone. Yeah. If, if, if you're going to try to, if you're going to try to tell me that a civilization that's capable of some kind of interstellar travel that depicts uh, capabilities that we've actually witnessed and recorded on multiple sensors is going to use the same kind of essentially carbon-based propulsion system that we use today You've got to be kidding me. There's no way that that's happening. So I'm going to tell you that that argument makes no sense at all. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, back to next. Yeah. That one. Okay. Oops. There, there we go. All right. Yeah, yeah, Mario, bring it up there. Now, so there's a bunch of, uh, of folks who do study these kind of futuristic ideas even if they're not necessarily firm believers in UFOs, okay? And so these, astrophy these astrophysicists, it's a specific branch of astrophysics we call cosmology, okay? And it, it's, it comprises a lot of different things, but one of the things they've done over the, over, over the years, and Carl Sagan was involved in this uh, rather heavily, is they've kind of categorized intelligent civilizations into three different types, okay? And so type one, type two, and type three. So type one is what they call a planetary civilization. Okay. First thing to note about a planetary civilization is that uh, most cosmologists will tell you that we are probably a uh, hundred years or so away from becoming this kind of civilization. We are not in our current state on earth. We are not considered by cosmologists as a type one civilization. Type one civilizations are those that are able to harness the forces of nature on the planet, okay? So they can control the weather, they can control earthquakes, all those kinds of things that we see that we just react to, a type one civilization would be actually able to control them. So that's a type one. Uh, they've actually done a calculation, Carl Sagan did, <coughs> excuse me, and, and he would put the earth at a 0.7 civilization. So he thinks we're roughly 100 years away from becoming possibly a type one. Okay, the next mm -hmm. civilization from that is a type two civilization. This is what's known as a stellar uh, civilization. This is about a thousand years more advanced than what we here are on Earth. And a stellar civilization is characterized by literally being able to harness the power of a star, okay? And the mm -hmm. simplest way to think about that is think about the TV show Star Trek. That civilization had the capability with all their cool toys in being able to harness star power, okay? And then we go to type three. Type three is known as a galactic civilization. Cosmologists will tell you we're probably 100,000 years away from becoming a galactic civilization. A galactic civilization is literally able to control time and space, okay? They now have harnessed the power of black holes, wormholes, and things like that. If you want to think about uh, popular culture, think of our friends in the Star Wars franchise. That universe, if you will, that uh, George Lucas created, those individuals are able to harness that kind of power. Okay. Now, if you look at those types, you say, okay, that's really interesting. Uh, but 100,000 years, right, people, again, they scoff at that and said, you've got to be kidding me. It's incomprehensible. Uh, you know, th that makes no sense. However, I want you to think on a cosmic scale now, not on a simple Earth-based scale. Mm -hmm. The universe has been around for over 13 billion years. 100,000 years is a blink of an eye on a 13 billion year time scale. So to have a civilization that is 100,000 years more advanced to us, while we might consider that unimaginable, it's not that big a deal when you consider the time scale of the universe. It really isn't, and it's very, very plausible. And so that brings us to the final piece of this puzzle, what we call the Drake Equation. A lot of people are familiar with the Drake Equation. I'm not gonna go into all the nitty gritty details, but it was created by a, 
an astronomer, and it was to try to quantify uh, the possibility of intelligent civilizations in our own galaxy as an example. And the way they did that was they did a bunch of terms. Okay, some were well known, some were more speculative. And what I did is I put numbers to these just uh, to give you some idea of how this works. So we, the first number we use is the average rate of star formation in our galaxy, which is fairly well known. The fraction of those stars which have planets, which were becoming well known now, which weren't at the time. And then the average number of habitable planets within those stars. Okay, now those three terms are reasonably well known uh, in the world of astro. Uh, physics and, and astrobiology and so we can we can look at those and, and not argue about them too much the other terms are a little more speculative so i picked some conservative ones okay the first one is the average uh the fraction of those habitable planets where life emerges okay i gave you a 0.01 could be uh could be more it could be less but it's conservative and so we'll use that the next one is the fraction of those uh, habitable, plan uh, habitable planets where life emerges, where it's now intelligent life that emerges. Okay, and again, we're going to go another order of magnitude beyond that because that's obviously becomes less likely as we go. And then the next term beyond that is the number or the fraction of intelligent species that are actually able to communicate on an uh, interstellar basis. And then the last piece of that is how long this civilization actually survives and is able to communicate out to uh, the rest of the galaxy. Okay, so if you take some, and again, I've made some conservative guesstimates for those numbers. If you take all those numbers, and then the way this equation works is you simply, um, you put them all together and you multiply. Okay, if you use that, the terms that I put in there, you come up with a point zero zero. 075 civilizations in our galaxy. Okay, in astronomical terms, we round that to one. That's pretty close to one. Well, we know there's one civilization in our galaxy, so that's not unreasonable. That again seems like you know that there's one and that's it. Well, that doesn't seem like much, but you gotta again look on universal uh, intergalactic terms. Remember, in the known universe, there are over 200 billion with the B galaxies. So now if we take that number, 0 0.00075, and we multiply it not by one galaxy, but by 200 billion galaxies, we get a much different view of the universe. We get the potential for 150 million That's intelligent civilizations in the universe. 50 million, wow. Okay, and once you have that kind of number, now you can say that the universe may be actually teeming with life. And if the universe is teeming with life, it's not that big of a step to say there's at least one civilization that's 100,000 years more advanced than us or more. Maybe, maybe they're a million years more advanced than we are. And if they are, then they've clearly learned how to manipulate gravity. And you can start to see where they can start to do the kind of things that we are witnessing. But again, we have no idea how to do it. And so you don't want to limit yourself just because we don't know how to do it doesn't mean it can't be done. It just simply means we don't know how to do it. Well, this uh, we just wanted to give a shout out to Cynthia Rossi watching our show, Ashley Kendrick, Vima up there in uh, Bristol, Tennessee. Uh, uh, and uh, we got Tickle Me and I'll Hurt You. <laughs> Is that somebody you know? No. All right. Well, no. someone we do know, Steve Rissmiller. Hi, Hi glad that you're Hi, watching. Steve. See you tonight at our astronomy club, hopefully. And Rishavi Sullivan, Chalad Zan, Denny Noah, uh, Carlton Bailey's watching, good friend of ours. Uh, of course, Robert Law, we got Marzil Krasowski. Krasowski, uh, yes. Uh, I think there's an actress, his name is kind of like that. <laughs> James Michael Sigler, thank you for staying curious. Hope Olaf Malik is enjoying this wonderful program. I know Christopher Mick is. He's in Hudson, Wisconsin, and he's a, 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 a solar system ambassador and outreach uh, there in uh, Wisconsin. Tom Usiak, you're enjoying your vacation, staying curious with uh, Ken Verderami here. Uh, Chalad Zan and Dave Stangy, hope you all are enjoying this wonderful edition of Stay Curious. An hour's gone by pretty fast here. I'll have you wrap it up for us here, Ken. Yep, we got two more slides here. So what do we know? So what's going on in the world of astrophysics? 
right now. And so uh, exoplanets is something people have probably heard about. It's been in the news the last couple of years, and it's simply an, a planet that orbits another star. Okay. Well, um, while it took us a long time to find the first exoplanet, right, Pegasi 51b, uh, we now have found over 4,000 confirmed exoplanets around 3,000 plus solar systems, right? And so uh, astrophysicists now believe that there are probably literally billions of exoplanets just in our galaxy alone. So again, with that number of exoplanets, the idea that there may be life uh, becomes much more of a possibility. Again, here's some quick, a couple just quick facts for you about a 51 Pegasi b. That was the first exoplanet was discovered in 1995. Again, it's known as a, a hot Jupiter. Basically, uh, you can see there some of the details about it, but, uh, and I won't read them for you, you can read them for yourselves, but uh, it was, uh, up until that time, there was a belief that maybe we were just on a wild goose chase, that our solar system was unique in, in the galaxy. But once we found one, clearly scientists believe there can be more than one, and now the search was on, and sure enough, with uh, the TESS missions and the Kepler missions, uh, we've discovered over 4,000 and are continuing to do that. Here's a couple of quick potentially potentially habitable exoplanets, and you can see the relatively uh, the relative distances from Earth. And this is a, a size chart that's uh, accurate. You can see our solar system in the right, and you can see the size of these exoplanets in comparison to that. Just a quick smattering of these planets four light years out to over 1,200 light years uh, away. Clearly, uh, if we're going to go visit those, we're going to need some kind of new propulsion system uh, than the one we currently use if we're ever going to get to visit those. Okay, and with that, that ends <laughs> my bit of this uh, little chat. Oh, so. God. wonderful, Ken. You're a great friend. You get so much information there to digest. You want to tell your friends to watch this again, Ken. Uh, a little personal thoughts here. Uh, you know, uh, one, you, have, you, you believe that these objects are alien. And uh, God, I hope, that, thank God they're not like Mars Attacks in the movie <laughs> and one the, the, because the great uh, uh, astrophysicist Stephen Hawking said, be careful what you ask for. Because he thinks aliens would be hostile wanting to steal our resources of this beautiful planet. So why are they so passive, you think, right now? And then and just, just, you're, you know, I, 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 I mean, Stephen Hawkins has an interesting take on it. And, and the one thing I will say is that, remember, that his, his take that, you know, in, if you look at human history, it, things never went well for the indigenous species when <laughs> visitors came. And while that's absolutely true, that is an Earth-centric viewpoint of the universe. I don't necessarily believe that you can apply an Earth-centric view to every intelligent life form out in the universe. What is to say that, why do we have to think that they all developed and they all think and act like us? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna tell you that Absolutely. I see just the opposite. Just, I think it's just as likely that they're, to use a, you know, uh, the part in the pun, that they're completely alien in the way they're going to act. And so they may simply just not be that interested in this other than saying well there's another life form because remember let's say there's more than one maybe it's not maybe there's a whole galactic you know society out there and it's not just one planet but one civilization and there's more than one visiting and they go yeah that's the earth that's interesting we're gonna they're not as advanced as us we're gonna kind of leave them alone for a while we'll watch them they're a curiosity but we're not going to get involved there's no reason to and the analogy cosmologists use and i'll end with this and that is you're walking down the street and you come to an anthill, okay, on the sidewalk, and you stop. And there's ants, this big ant hill, and there's thousands of ants, and they're scurrying around doing things. Do you stop to commune with the ant hill? Say, let me talk to the ants and see what they're up to today. This is really interesting. You walk on your way, you could care less. Hmm. I'm going to tell you that if the aliens hmm. are 300,000 years advanced to us, they may, we may not appear all that interesting to them, even though we think we're really interesting things. They may not think that, and so they're just we're just a curiosity. Another and, anthill you know, yeah. in, the, in the universe. Yeah, you know, so yeah. you, ah. you, you got to not think in just Earth-based terms when you're thinking about alien civilizations. Well, that's hard for me to do, but you're <laughs> right out there, so that's good. <laughs> Ken, thank you so much. Thank you. I, I know everybody enjoyed that, and like I said, tell your friends to watch it on YouTube. 
Uh, I'm going to go back and watch some of this again. I've heard Ken talk about this many times. Every time you up the level with the current knowledge and so forth, uh, should we be scared? I don't think so. I, I, I mean, this has been going on for so long that if they met, I think that if alien civilization meant the Earth harm, they would have harmed us already. What are they waiting for? There's there no reason to wait. They've been, you know, these sightings didn't happen last week. They've been happening for some would say hundreds of years. Hmm. So what are you waiting for? Well, good stuff there. Thank you, Ken, for your time coming in here. He was here with us in July uh, uh, when we were doing one of our first uh, uh, Streamlabs broadcast, Marty. Uh, and uh, we'll have you back again, Ken, and talk about some other things. He does a great talk about how to become an astronaut and the training involved in that. So uh, thank you very much on behalf of our wonderful museum here. Uh, and Marty Winkle, we will be with you again tomorrow to talk about the only woman to fly solo ever in a spaceship. Of course, Valentina Tryshakova celebrating her first uh, flight and only flight in Vostok uh, in 1963. So with that, I'm Mark Marquette, and we'll see you tomorrow on Stay Curious to bridge the space between us.